welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the next instalment in the incredible series by Vato Cabron. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled My wife and I bought a ranch in the mountains last year, and my neighbour had some interesting suggestions on how to manage our new land. Part 5. The Ghosts Arrive Let's get straight into that. After the final scarecrow ordeal in early November, I slept for almost 26 straight hours. I took most of that following week off work to get back into the groove of physical and mental stability, spend time with Sasha, and reflect. I'd put Sasha, Dash, and old Dan in direct danger and felt more worthless than I ever had. I wanted to move. I wanted to sell this place and quit my job and never look back. Under the circumstances that accompanying living here, I felt I couldn't trust myself. My instincts were to try and kill danger, not learn its nuances and live in harmony with it. I wanted Sasha to make the final call. I needed it to be her decision. I told her how I felt, and I told her how much I truly trust her instincts. I promised that if she wanted to say, I would commit to it entirely, and that we'd act decisively together, but that I'd let her be the quarterback of all of this spirit-related decision-making. After I passed out that day, Dan called over Joe, and before I came to, Joe spent a long while talking with Sasha about the nature of this place and the spirit. That conversation gave Sasha a new confidence and seemed to catalyze a deeper connection between her and this little 40-acre chunk of possessed, beautiful land. And during the days that followed, Sasha listened to me. I listened to her, and she made it clear that she wanted to stay, unless or until it would make me miserable. I told her I'm in, if she is, which I meant, and I still do. I love this land, on the surface, at least. In that week off, I spent wallowing in self-reflection and self-pity. I somehow managed to look under my own hood for the first real time to reflect on how I'd been wired. It took me a while to get right after falling back into civilian life, and a big part of that for me was revisiting trauma, digesting it, and shitting it out behind me on the road of life. The imminent prospect of having a reunion with some of that shit was making me a nervous wreck, and so, naturally, I figured maybe chain-smoking and reflecting on my own head was the right thing to do. On my 18th birthday, a clueless dipshit with zero life experience, a ditched high school calculus, hopped on a bus downtown and sold my soul to an organisation unmatched throughout human history in its ability to tear down and comprehensively redesign young men from the ground up into guerrilla-brained warfighters. And for the next six years, that was life. Two-thirds which was fluorescent lit, sleep-deprived monotony punctuated by training stints in fenced-off expanses of the American West the other third, Afghanistan. And even though everything I did was decided for me, Afghanistan was the first time in my life I ever felt free. It's where I first learned how I was unique, the first time I'd ever been valued by people above me, people I admired, first time I experienced being a real source of comfort to others. Also, the experience of combat between men fascinated me. It's a defining and invertebrate type of human interaction and utility. As old as feasting, dancing, monogamous romance, music, hunting, shit, it's older than farming. And I don't mean war, all that macro level strategy and geopolitical bullshit. I'm talking about combat. There's a simplicity to it. The fundamentals of combat still transcend time and culture, which creates a connection to something old, something that feels deeply, tragically human. I'm here in this cold, dusty valley to tear that man's body apart with steel and fire, while he'll be trying to do the same to me. The abject, terrifying clarity of it is intoxicating. However, most of my time there was still frustrating. 
a Marine Infantry Battalion full of fast, strong, competitive, stupid-ass 18 to 22-year-olds programmed to eat fucking glass and do anything to protect each other is a terrifying thing capable of terrifying shit. And that's not the kind of tool you use for everything. Between boot camp and ITB, you're turned into a rifleman, a 0311, a grunt. You're designed with the expressly articulated purpose of storming beaches, sieging fortifications, spearheading invasions, or bleeding to death while trying. In my opinion, sending marine grunts to lap around as street cops in an area with lots of civilians and a hostile insurgency dressed as civilians is fantastically fucking stupid. Alas, that's a lot of what we did. Checkpoints, searching cars, frisking old people, and getting harassed by snipers. Driving around, slaloming duct-taped bundles of 35-year-old explosives buried under the road. Fuck that noise. After over a year of that, my battalion joined a seven-country coalition force for the invasion of Majar. And that was my high point. That was a battle. We went from playing beat cop to banging it out against hardened Taliban warriors who cut their teeth against the Soviets when I was still shitting myself. These were bad dudes who'd come down from the Kush and tribal Pakistan openly, proudly self-branded as a religious inquisition. Guys who, if we killed, could no longer beat women and kids for wearing colours or singing in their own homes. Or kill young men for learning the guitar or just talking back. It meant something. And when that operation wrapped up, well, felt to me like we went back to squabbling with normal assholes like myself. Young dudes who were just fucking pissed. I was done. The spark was dead. I didn't want to be a fucking cop. I had an opportunity to get out and I jumped. But that meant I had to separate and integrate back into 21st century America. Which, to my surprise, I ended up managing. Mostly because of meeting Sasha. But also some other friends who showed me one needn't be surrounded by screaming, panic and death to find themselves. Since then, I've grown gentler and more caring. I've come to appreciate the immense value of experiences and relationships outside the fucking Marine Corps. I don't feel my purpose on Earth is to fight. With that being said, I'm not wired to think around a physical threat. I'm wired to spit in its eye, headbutt it and heel stomp its knuckles when it's down. And thus, when it comes to a gracefully navigating the bizarre, horrifying and violent manifestations of some ancient motherfucking Earth spirit that seems to have developed a uniquely individualised distaste for my well-being and sanity, it goes against everything in me. The prospect of this winter was a nightmare. The very people who I was programmed to confront with violence, and then actually did confront with violence, were coming back to pay me a visit. Oh, I was fucking terrified. But I promised Sash I'd try and tell her I needed to leave if I knew I couldn't take it. And so, life went on. We fell back into a healthy stride through November. I spent a lot of time grouse and pheasant hunting with Dash. Sash and I cooked every night. Once we knew we were off the hook after the third scarecrow, we hastily invited all of Sash's family to visit for Thanksgiving and finally see the place. Her parents, brother, sisters and one of her sister's two kids and husband all came out. A couple stayed at our tiny house while the rest crashed at Dunn's and Lucy's while they spent Thanksgiving with their kids in Boyce. It was actually a great time. We hiked and cooked and drank. It showed us that if we got a grip on the timing of all of this spirit bullshit, we could actually lead a relatively normal life. And with the ghost season approaching, I also spent as much time with Dan as I could to prepare myself. I needed to be able to handle this one as calmly as possible. And given how I'd escalated things over the summer, Dan and Joe said the earliest the ghost had arrived is December 13th, and so between Thanksgiving and that date, it was my objective to get as zen about it all as I possibly could. I went over to Dan's one evening for some beers and a chat shortly after Sash's family left, and we set out in his barn looking out over his pastures. It's hard, Harry. I ain't gonna lie to you. It's hard on Luce too. Lord knows. Sash won't be able to see him, but she'll sure as shit know they're there. That's an easy way to mess with the head, you know. Although I will say, and Dan took a long pull of his beer and stared ahead blankly, 
for a while before responding. I will say Luce and Sasha are damn lucky they can't see or hear them. Why? I asked, already kind of grasping the answer. Well, the bastard ghosts are trying to scare you and unsell you the whole time they're here, Harry. At least most of mine do. They wait outside the door and jump at you when you walk outside. They'll pop into a window screaming when they can feel you're looking outside. They'll wait until you're fast asleep and start screaming outside the bedroom. They'll run around your roof at night. They'll pound on the walls and it wears on you. Ugh. I felt a nauseous panic even hearing about this shit, but I needed to learn as much as I could. Uh, can I touch them? Can they touch me? Can they touch Sasha or Dash or my stuff? Uh, can they let the air out of my tires or some shit? Tan smiled, but a grim look slowly overtook his features as he responded. Uh, if they're outside your home, they can't touch you, and you can't touch them. Every once in a while, if one gets real worked up and angry... They can knock something over, like a chair or something. That's not common, though. Seems to take a lot out of them. You can hear them touching your house, though, pounding on the walls and running on your roof, smacking the glass. Oh, they don't do any damage, but you and I can hear it. And sometimes Lucy can, too. Same thing with their screaming. Once in a while, if one's real angry and they scream right into Lucy's ear, she can hear it. Dan looked up and stared at, well, nothing, and went on. The same guy likes to pick on Lucy too, year after year. I call him the whelp. He follows Luce everywhere when she goes outside. He's one of the worst. Real scary for Luce too. It's horrible. Makes me want to kill the little bastard all over again. I've raged, taunted, even tried to befriend him, but nothing changes. That's the kind of shit that scared me and would test my ability to keep it cool. I'd really hoped they'd leave Sasha be. I'd sleep outside in the 15 degree winters for a month if it meant keeping them away from her. Can I just leave? Dan, can I just fucking leave when they show up? Dan looked over at me and responded promptly. No, you can't. I've tried a couple of times. They'll be there when you get back and make sure you suffer the two to three weeks of their presence, one way or another. My third year here, I was really losing it. Joe told me it wouldn't work, but I lit out, paid my summer ranch hands to feed the cattle, packed loose in my oldest boy in the camper, spent the winter with my brother in Montana. I got back that spring and there they were. Let me tell you, you do not want to have to deal with the ghosts and the lights at the same time. No, you got to suffer through this, son. He looked at me with sympathy. Harry, just be glad you've got only four. Having twelve of them is, well, it's quite a goat rope. Dan looked over at me and looked inquisitive. How confident are you there are only four, huh? I'd given the answer to his question lots of thoughts over the last few months. I'm pretty confident, maybe five, six, but unlikely. Before Majar, I only fired my rifle maybe four or five times and... Mostly just suppressing fire up into an empty hillside after having a pot shot or rocket whip in out of nowhere. Majar was crazy. We were in firefights all the damn time. Obviously there was the possibility a stray bullet clipped someone, but those odds are slim. So yeah, I'm confident it's four. Dan took another drink and set his beer down and turned his chair to face me more directly. Leaned back and nodded. Tell me about them. I gave him an annoyed look. I'd never been squirmy talking about it, but given the prospect of an imminent reunion with the bastards, that had changed lately. Well, I opened a new beer. The first time I shot a man dead, I shot two men dead, back to back. They were right next to each other. And Dan nodded. Go on, son. Tell me about it. I gave him another annoyed look. It was during the first couple heavy days in the Battle for Majar. I found my team was hunkered into the bayon at the end of the street waiting for orders. I was with my buddy Mike. All of a sudden we see two guys, look like they were in their mid-thirties, running down a line of houses from our left. One had an AK and the other one had a radio and had a big like hockey bag full of spent RPG tubes. I took a sip and then another. We couldn't believe it. 
I literally nudged Mike and was like, are those fucking tally? I mean, we knew they were, but just couldn't believe it. They got to the road in front of us, about 110 yards out, and crouched behind a car blocking a view from where they'd run, but exposed to us. We were so shocked that we just sat there like idiots until one of the closest ones to us looked up at me, and I shot them both, and they died right there. I sat there and remembered how, when I shot the first guy, he dumped forward onto his face, didn't try to catch himself or anything, and the second guy looked down to him like, heck you doing, dude? And then I shot him in the chest. He dropped the radio as he planted his palms to catch himself from falling backwards. He looked so confused before I shot him again. Dan snapped me out of my recollection. What are you going to name him? What? I asked. It helps if you give them names. Helps to keep track of them. Describe them to Sasha. Helps to talk about them. Naming them makes it easier. Takes the edge off a bit. I guess that made sense. I shrugged. Pete and Hank? Dan slapped his knee. Great names. All right. Number three. And I took another sip. Uh, number three was a couple of days later. Old grizzled fella, 50, 55 years old at least. We were secure in a canal crossing. L-shaped ambush type security formation and staying behind cover. Two trucks full of dudes with AKs rolled up and stopped behind a sedan. We used to block the road. Someone kicked it off and all of a sudden our whole platoon was unloading into their cars. I was aiming at the rear passenger side door of the second truck when someone tried to get out and I shot him. He died with his seatbelt on. I thought back to that moment. The car door of that truck was stuck on something. So the guy reached out the window to open it from the outside and I shot his forearm. I remembered how shocked I was by how much blood came from that wound. How it cut bright red channels through the dust caked on the car door. He yanked his arm back in and then leaned out with his left hand, exposing his head. And I shot him in the jaw and then the eyebrow. Dan snapped me back to the present again. What do you call him? Well, he looked like a mountain man. I call him Bridger. Dan nodded approvingly. Now number four. It was after the heavy fighting of Majar ended. Still in Hellmound, but only in the countryside. Poppy country. Dope country, Dan laughed. Uh, we were on patrol and got ambushed by what sounded like 50, but ended up just being four dudes. NCO and my platoon got hit and we all dropped. I called over to the side of the poppies along a ditch and saw a dude running real low, right towards me with an AK. Scared the piss out of me, but I got a draw on him and that was that. Or in reality, that guy scared me so bad I'd emptied my whole mag into him. Or at him, barely aiming. I missed half the shots I was shaking so bad. I'm pretty sure I shot him in the foot, neck and ten other spots in between. I looked back at Dan. I call him Buck. And Dan nodded slowly. So, what about the potential other two? I scratched my chin. During the heavy fighting in Majar, February, a car full of fighters trying to break through our sector and run into a whole damn company. I wasn't in a good position when we made contact, and so by the time I moved past a little wall and started shooting into the guys in the back seat, I'm pretty sure they were dead. I mean, at least 10 or 12 of the guys were already lighting up that rig, so chances are slim anyone was still alive. You just don't know for sure. Dan and I sat quietly with our beers for a while. Cold was starting to bite my hands. I needed to head back for dinner soon, but I had a couple more questions. Dan, we'll be able to see each other's ghosts. And Dan looked up at me. No, at least I can see Joel's or his son's and he can see mine. But we can each feel the others. And Dan looked away and, sensing my impending question, spoke again without looking back. I'll let Joel tell you about his, if he chooses. And I nodded. Sasha had been thinking a lot about Dan's account of the one man he'd killed being respectful to him and Lucy during the ghost season. She thinks there may be a way to make peace with them if we could learn more about who they were before they died and have things around that they liked or figure out how to keep them occupied. You said they maintained some of their earthly personalities. What's that mean? You told me that one guy who you comforted as he died remembers you and is pretty mellow, but like, are they pissed they're here? 
Where are they coming from? Do they even know? Do they remember who they are? Their families? Dan put his hands up to cease my barrage. Easy, easy, pal. Those all got different answers, he chuckled. First of all, I got no idea where they're coming from or what happens after you get killed. And Joe and I are pretty sure they don't remember where they were before they get here. I don't think they know why they're here or why they get brought here. But they know one thing. You're the reason they're dead. And now they're seeing you live your life. Seeing you love, work, eat. And let me tell you, they sure get pissed, hot and bothered about that. On your other question, they remember parts of who they were, I think. There's no way to communicate with them directly. I tried getting a Vietnamese interpreter to write some things in English and Vietnamese, which I could try to read and show them 12 to 15 years back. But it's like they can't hear or read anything. It's like direct communication is prevented. Although you can show them things. One of the guys I killed must have been a birder, a bird geek, you know, always checking out birds. Two to three years back, I pointed out an eagle to him. He watched it for a long time and nodded to me, and since he's been a little bit more civil. Another must be a gardener, because when he ain't harassing me, he'll follow Lucy around our winter greenhouse, just observing the gardening methods and spend hours checking out seed packets, that kind of shit. And then there's Wolf, the fella I have the, uh, you know, connection with. My friend, I guess. He must have been a good man before I cut his life short. As I said, he hangs back and smiles, walks the land on his own, doesn't harass me or Lucy. I couldn't even begin to fathom how different I was a person from the guys I'd killed, or how I'd connect with them on any level. There's a chance some of those tribal fighters never even owned a world map, let alone knew where the hell Idaho was. Maybe some of the younger ones who had some schooling opportunities had gotten on the internet, but it really was rare for rural Afghani and Pakistani men to get schooling outside a local Islamic madrasa slash school. It's like they were from different planets. I had a few more chats like that with Dan as Thanksgiving rolled into December, all of which he'd end with, Just don't let those candles go out before sunrise. If you do, fight. You can't get away in time. I could tell he was getting apprehensive too, and getting shook up after 40 years of experience that made me nervous as hell. Lucy had given Sasha some pointers as well. I can't imagine it's much easier for Sasha and Luce. At least I can see the fuckers. For them, it's just like the place is haunted as hell. Lucy seemed to handle it well though, saying while they're here, she mostly just tries to keep Dan calm. She said a few times a season, they'll really scare her, screaming in her ear or knocking things over when she's outside alone, but she said you kind of get used to it. Lucy said no matter how many winters have passed, she still finds Dan up in the middle of the night, what I hear, sitting in the kitchen with his rifle, watching the candles and making sure they'll stay lit. Sasha seemed almost excited with anticipation as December 13th got closer. I was a nervous wreck the closer it got, and trying to keep that from Sasha made it even worse. She found some big-ass 24-hour burning candles online too, and we ordered every last one of them. Figured if we lit six or seven of those in the kitchen island every night where they stood, no risk of getting put out by a breeze. We could feel confident we'd have four going all night and we could get some sleep. But I knew damn well I'd not be sleeping much while they were here. Shit. My anxiety got so bad after Thanksgiving I'd barely seen sleep anyway. I woke up on the morning of December 13th, emotionally exhausted. I was almost praying they'd arrive. I needed it to start. The waiting was maddening, but it didn't show up on that day. Or the next, or the next. Since the 13th, I spent every daylight hour on my land with binoculars, scanning the tree lines. I woke up on the morning of December 21st, and, as I had for a week, I sat up, turned around, and immediately looked out the window into the pastures. Nothing. It was snowing pretty hard. My wake-up panic eased, and then I realised Sasha wasn't in bed, which cranked it right back up. I never slept through her getting out of bed, especially over the last week when I'd wake up on the verge of pissing myself if the dog farted or the furnace kicked on. Sash, I said loudly, seeing if she was in the bathroom. 
I got up and almost ran into the living room towards the kitchen. Sash! I'm in the kitchen, babe, she said. I could hear her smiling in her voice. It made me calm down immediately. I walked in and saw her sitting at the kitchen table with a coffee and a book. Dash was at her feet and trotted over to greet me. Shit. Sorry, I didn't notice she got up. I, uh, I shook my head and leaned down to kiss her. And as I stood back up, she gave me a smile, but something subtle in it betrayed. I couldn't tell what, but I knew this woman well. What? I asked her. The second a word left my mouth, she let out the emotional slip through her smile again. Babe, what is it? I asked again, seriousness in my tone. She closed her book and took a deep breath. What the fuck is she about to tell me? Is she pregnant? She stood up and took my hands and looked at me in the eye. She had so much strength in that gaze. She had so much faith. I was floored. And then she spoke. Harry, it woke me up an hour ago at sunrise, but I wanted you to sleep. I can feel it. It might be the ghosts or not, but I tell you right now, the spirit is here. I know it. Her demeanour of strength didn't change at all. When my entire stomach shot into my throat and adrenaline surged into my hands and legs. I couldn't think of what to say, but wasn't sure I could talk if I did. I thought I was prepared for this. Thought I'd seen and felt all the ambient dread the spirit could cause. But I'd be wrong. And she was right. I felt it. The spirit. Standing there, in that kitchen, feeling like I was about to vomit, looking at my wife's beautiful, strong face. I felt the spirit in the air pressure. I saw it in the light. Tasted it at the back of my throat. In that moment, I don't know that I'd ever felt more childlike horror in my life. Felt like I was in a nightmare, stuck in a dark room, as something I felt wanted me came slowly giggling down the hallway. I could feel them. I could feel five. I knew I'd killed five people. Five men. I knew without seeing them, more than them, I could feel the spirit. My peripheral vision started to go dark, my ears were rumbling, and I could feel my heartbeat in my face. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes. Chill, man. Breathe. You are not going to pass out without ever seeing the bastards. Harrison? I snapped out of it and looked back into Sasha's eyes, still holding her hands. Harrison, you've got this. We've got this. Okay? I nodded and took another breath. There are five. I killed five men and they're here. I can feel them. I know the four, not sure who the fifth is. A brief, thin fear flushed into Sasha's face at my response. But she forced it away and replaced it with strength, took a deep breath herself and said, Well then, there are five, and we got this, okay? My reflexive antidote to panic showed up like a deranged sidekick. The white-hot desire to fight pleading in shrieks for me to get angry. It grounded me, but I reasoned it away. Nope. Tried that. Didn't go so fucking well, idiot. I went to the sink and chucked some water. I looked down at Sash, looking up at me, and her eye contact activating the motion in his plumed tail. Then I looked back to Sasha. Sweet Christ, how did I get so lucky to find these two? I felt like weeping in gratitude, terror, shame, and joy all at once. Breathe, dude. Sash, I need to go find them. I need to go find them by myself. I won't do anything or go more than a few feet from the fence, I swear to you. I just need to see them alone for the first time. She looked back at me with a challenge in her eyes. Hey, you better be fucking sure about this look. And then nodded. Only if you bring Dash and I'm coming out there in ten minutes, okay? I nodded. Yeah, of course. I felt like explaining my need to confront them for the first time alone, but it was something I think we could both feel without the need for more words. I got dressed, grabbed my binoculars and followed Dash out into the yard. I'd stop and look out into the property every ten steps. I got to the gate and still didn't see anything. Dash and I walked a short way into the pasture to where I could see a view down into one of the corners of the property. An eye shot into my veins as I could feel the blood leaving my face. I didn't need binoculars, and even though they were about 250 yards away, I could clearly see five men standing a few feet apart from one another in a row, defined by the snow like shadows. 
My heart was pounding. The man in the middle stood out, even at this distance. He was the tallest. His Parahan turban, poncho sized scarf, pacol hat, all jet black. I raised my binoculars. He was staring directly into my eyes. Bridger, the man I'd killed in the ambush, scrambling to get out of his dusty truck. This isn't fucking real, I thought. I looked up into the white sky and then back to the house, rubbed my eyes and looked back into the binoculars. He hadn't moved. I looked at the others. None were looking at me, just gazing around up at the trees, mountains, and they looked confused. I immediately recognised the two men I'd first killed, Hank and Pete, and the guy I'd shot on the edge of the poppy field, Buck, and then the other. Fuck me! I guess I killed one of those guys after all, in the back of the truck as they tried to break through our line. He was young, maybe 20, 21. He had a fierce, wild eyes, even as he stood calmly, gazing up towards the mountain. I looked back to Bridger, the old warrior. Right as I saw he was still staring at me, sporting a look of focus and almost parental judgement, he took one step directly towards me and stopped. I made my mouth run dry, my hands go numb. The other four looked at him, almost with confusion, and then all four of them, all at the same time, looked up at me, straight into my binoculars, and I could see it. Recognition in their eyes. Subtle disbelief chased by anger, but the youngest, the surprise, he looked different. He lowered his head slightly, but held my gaze with an expression of calm, collected, murderous hatred. And as I took my next breath, those five men's fury, their fear, their grief, pain, confusion, it all seemed to turn into a noxious gas that rushed into my lungs, where it twisted and weaved into a throbbing, screaming hot cyst that ruptured in my gut and washed through my nervous system as I exhaled. It made me shudder and start to cough, the last of which was a gag. That was the spirit, not the ghosts. I knew it. I'm not sure how, but I did, and I took a deep breath trying to focus. There's nothing actually inside of you. Relax, that was just part of this wicked fuckery. And I realised Dash was poor in my leg. I patted his head. It's alright, buddy. It's alright. I thought about Joe. Follow the methods and Sasha will be safe. I got a grip and looked back down at the ghosts who hadn't moved or taken a gaze from me. As we stared across the pasture at each other, I got a shockingly nostalgic sensation from my childhood. One I'd get as I walked along the chain link fence around the junkyard between my house and the bus stop, staring down in fascinated terror at the furious snarling guard dog that would rage alongside me in a frenzied storm of frothing drool and kicked up dust every time I passed by. Knowing the fence was the only thing keeping me from the beast ripping and tearing into my 11 year old body. And I felt the same old physical sensation too. The coiled, wet knots of tension in my muscles as I subconsciously prepared to explode into a sprint. I felt angry. It was initially directed at these men, but was refocused, almost forcefully like a meat hook in the muzzle of my anger being hauled towards the spirit, like it wanted my rage and contempt. It hit me then, a realisation. This thing wanted me to give it a reason, it wanted me to rage. I thought on that earlier after the scarecrow, but I felt it for the first time. I wasn't going to give it that. I couldn't give it that. Staring down at them, standing on my land, posing a threat to my family, I felt guilt. It wasn't really guilt for killing them, but more because they got killed fighting at home, or at least relatively close to home, by dudes from across the goddamn planet. I had known for years before, but never like that in that moment. There's no amount of those strenuously cobbled together musings about serving your country, or the invertebrate nature of men in war. That can rebuke these five men's unalienable right to absolutely fucking hate me. I turned and went back into the yard. As I went to shut the gate, Dash looked back at behind him, tilting his head as he does when he smells a grouse, and then looked back to me with urgency. I know, buddy. Let's go inside. I sat with Sasha and told her about what I'd seen and who the fifth man was. We'd both taken all the days off through New Year's and the prospect of this being day one of the uninterrupted 12-day stint here made me feel like ripping out my hair, totally trapped. 
The rest of the day, Sasha tried to be as jolly as possible. We weren't religious, but Sasha loved Christmasing. Out of house, so we hung lights and reefs, drank hot toddies, and played holiday music. Every chance I got, I'd peek out the window into the pasture to see if they were starting to move closer. We picked out a little spruce out of the bottom of the driveway to cut down to decorate, which Sash asked if I wanted to go get with her. I didn't need to respond for her to pick up what my vibe was putting down. Harry, we can't let them dictate our lives. If we follow the methods, we'll be safe. I think we should make it known that we're going to go on about our lives unafraid. I don't want to push you if you don't want to. I can't see him, but that's how I feel we should handle this. I just wanted to sit inside and drink more whiskey for the next two to three weeks, but she was trying to be strong for me, I could tell. I didn't want to leave that unappreciated. Let's do it. We grabbed the handsaw and walked down the driveway, cutting fresh tracks into the snow, and with Dash bounding ahead, his red golden coat standing out against the snow like a warm flame. I could feel Sasha watching my gaze as I looked out into the meadow. Can you see him? Four of them had moved a bit closer to the pond out in the pasture and were staring at us. Bridger and three others. Couldn't tell which. I have four of them. Not sure where the fifth is. Sash squeezed my hand affectionately. I wish I could see them too, babe. I'm sorry I can't. I kissed her cheek. I'm glad you can't. We got to the little spruce tree at the bottom of the driveway. This one? I asked. Sash responded with a bit of a added gusto. It's perfect. Don't you love it, Dash? I smiled. And she was trying so hard that it gave me a wasp sting of guilt and affection. I took a knee and started to saw at the little trunk. About halfway through, I gripped the tree with my free hand and pulled it to open a cut a bit for the blade and shook snow off the limbs that snuck in the back of my jacket, startling me as the ice hit my neck and went down my shirt. Oh, shit! I laughed. I heard Sasha laugh back at me. Nice move there, babe. I turned around to throw a handful of snow at her, and what I saw scared me so bad an electric burst of terror wrapped adrenaline tore through my body. So fast, I let out a half a scream, half grunt. My shock yanked Sasha's smile away and replaced it with a look of dread, and she immediately shot her hands up to her face. Babe, what? One of the ghosts, the young one, the surprise, was standing right next to Sasha. Facing her, hands clenched into fists at its sides, leaning forward into the side of her face. I started to stand up, and Sasha took steps towards me, while telling her head to follow my gaze, and when he screamed, mouth as wide as a human's ever should be, putting what looked like every part of his body into it, he blasted out a raspy shriek that was low and high in pitch. I winced as the noise smashed into my eardrums, like a truck hitting a deer without even tapping the brakes with ripples of heat distortion pouring from his mouth like a furnace. The scream had such force, it knocked off Sasha's wool hat, blowing her hair and the snow falling around her, head sideways. She jumped in terror and lost her footing, stumbling to the land hard on her side. I surged up and drove towards her, and Dash went berserk, teeth bared, snarling and snapping his fangs at the noise. Unsure where to direct the savage attack, you could see he was ready to dedicate every muscle to and it was over in three seconds. Are you okay? Sash, are you okay? And she had tears welling in her eyes and was staring in shock into, for her, the snowflakes in the air where the scream had erupted from. She blinked her shock away and then nodded, looking at me with a forced smile. I'm fine, I'm fine, I just fell over. Won't even be a bruise, okay? I helped her up and turned her up the driveway as we both yelled for Dash to follow us. I glanced at the other four ghosts who hadn't moved. Could you see it before... before it screamed at me? Sash asked. Yeah, for a split second. It came out of nowhere. I looked back to call for Dash again, who hadn't let up on his feral snarling. The ghost of the young man was smiling at me, with provocation and malice in his eyes. And although, to my surprise, he did actually seem a bit uneasy about the dog like he was trying to hold his ground, flinching very subtly when Dash would lunge with a bark. Switching his gaze from me to the dog, like looking away from Dash for too long, might give him an opening. Which one was it, Harry? Is he still there? Sash asked. 
Yeah, still there. His apparent fear of the dog made my rage boil up behind my eyes more than his cocky little smile did. Like it was a weakness I needed to exploit, a broken nose I needed to keep landing punches into. As though sensing my ire, Sasha grabbed me by the chin and forced my eyes to hers. Harry, it's okay, babe, it's okay. The guy just scared me. Screw him, right? Let's go start dinner. She still had tears in her eyes, and one ran down her frost reddened cheek. And while she was forcing a smile, there was sincerity in it as well. The volume of Dash's barking was amplified by the oppressive silence of a snowy afternoon in the mountains. I took a deep breath. You're right. I looked back at the ghost. But fuck him. Let's get our tree, yeah? When I looked back at her, she gave me a smile and a proving nod. Let's get our tree. I turned back down the driveway, but I froze before taking a step as my heart leapt into my throat and it felt like my stomach flipped upside down. The other four ghosts were all on our side of the pond now, 50, 60 yards away, standing, staring at me. Spread out into new positions, normal men couldn't have possibly reached in such a short time, nor without leaving any tracks in the snow as they managed. What? Sasha asked as she grabbed my hand. I took a breath and looked back to her and forced a smile. Nothing, babe. I stomped over to the saw, and as if sensing our plan to finish what we'd started, Dash calmed and looked at me and wagged his tail then bounded up to Sasha and planted himself, head low between her and the ghost. I picked up the saw and looked at the young man. His smile was fading, being replaced by anger, which made me smile. More of a cat guy, huh? I asked him as I bent down and saw the last inch or two of the tree. I gripped the sappy, cold trunk, hoisted a little tree over my shoulder and turned to the young man. His face... All condescension gone was twisted into a rictus of hate. Looking at these ghosts wasn't quite the same as looking at a living person, but the difference was small. They weren't translucent, and I could see pores and scars in his skin, but it still kind of looked like looking at something when you're having a migraine. Their legs, arms, torso, and head are all there, but you can only clearly see whatever you're looking at directly. Their periphery is just elusive, hard to describe. We stared at each other for a few long moments. He looked to be about my age when we last met. I remembered him then, seeing a guy in my rifle company drag his body by the ankle to a row of other fighters he had been killed with. The friction of the road pulling his shirt up over his head, exposing the bullet holes and coagulated blood covering his stomach and sternum. And then the image of him screaming into Sasha's face flooded in. And I pointed at him with my saw and nodded. Slick move, hombre. For real. Top-notch spook manoeuvre. I'll call you creeps. Disgust joined the hate in his glower. As I turned back towards Sash, my heart skipped a beat again as adrenaline shot into my face. The other four ghosts were all clustered now, only twenty yards away in the meadow, and with Bridger in front. He looked at me with a fiery judgement. My ears popped and my hands started shaking. As we locked eyes, my mind dredged up long-forgotten details, apprehensively searching his body for a suicide vest, smelling smoky pine in his clothes, and leaning across him to unbuckle his seatbelt. The soft tinking of the dying engine, unceremoniously pulling him out of that smoking blood-riddled truck down onto the road, and seeing shattered glass under him, and almost reflexively reaching down to move his head so he wouldn't cut himself. The brief glance of shock at me having that trace of humanity left in me, which I remembered almost feeling proud of myself for. Harry, what is it? I snapped out of my strange recall and looked at Sasha, who looked concerned. I shook my head. Nothing, darling. I turned back to Bridger, closed my eyes and bowed my head towards him. When I looked back up, his expression hadn't changed. That was a very long night, but far easier than those that followed. Wow, 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 and another one, wow. Absolutely awesome and skin crawlingly creepy stuff there from the wonderful mind of Vato Cabron. As ever, a huge thank you brother for allowing me to narrate your work on the channel. It's a huge honor and I know I'm really enjoying this series as much as the listeners. 
As ever, guys and girls, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? Of course, I'm always on the lookout for new stories or new series. If you feel you have that, or possibly you want to have a shot at being a writer, please do get in touch with myself at the email, which of course is dmtforestoffear at gmail.com. As ever, guys and girls, I hope you're all well and happy, keeping focused and fit as possible. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.